Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is the session about scale and complexity uh, as part of the day on the Cloud 2030 Summit. You know, it, one of the things that we really have trouble comprehending as humans is just how big and interconnected everything gets. And that was the topic that we turned to at this point, uh, because really, as things get so big, it's going to become impossible for us to maintain it. Um, that could mean rise of the machines and AI is doing all our work, or it could just mean we build really fragile stuff. And that is what we took on in this session. So enjoy it. As always, we want to hear your thoughts and feedback, the2030.cloud, to join in the conversations. And by the way, you know, we're halfway through. I think one thing that we're kind of touching on but not explicitly talking about is product management. Um, as an industry, or I should say as consumers to a certain extent, some of us have been involved in, in uh, creating stuff. But uh, fundamentally, I think most of this conversation is around us being consumers of, of uh, products that um, the product management skill set is now a requirement for any modern company that consumes IT. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people fully understand. Um, it used to be that you could just go to IBM or um, Ross Perot's company or any of the other companies that spun out afterwards, and you'd only have to have maybe one or two vendors. And then funny thing happened about 15, 20 years ago, suddenly the whole market just exploded with all kinds of options. And now there's all these different kinds of integrations that you can uh, perform. And obviously operations becomes critical then, it's, as I, we were talking about earlier. But the skill set of being able to have your own in-house product management of understanding, we're fundamentally building a product internally and we're supporting our customers who are our employees. How do we do that? How do uh -huh. we do that from quarter to quarter? How do we deploy new versions? When do we depreciate old stuff and get rid of it? Companies suck at that really bad right now because they, I think to a certain extent, as we didn't in OpenStack initially, we were totally focused on the development um, we didn't focus at all initially on the products, supporting it long term. When do we say this old stuff needs to go away? John, so, anyway, are you saying really are you saying that as a consumer of technology, an IT organization for one of these end users of technology has to think of their operations, their IT infrastructure as a product, their in-house users, as their customers and therefore an internal form of product management, that being whatever is being delivered to the in-house consumer, as opposed yep. to a vendor. Is that is that the is that another way of saying what you've just pointed yes. out? Yes. Yep. Because it's Thanks. it's that complicated. There is no one vendor. There's no IBM to save our bacon. There's no AWS to save us. It's so it's, it's just it's consumer, it, it's consumer side product management. And you, and yeah, I guess that's the way of putting it, sure. And if you, if you, if we think about, again, cloud 2030, you know, I'm looking at, I, I still haven't did an inventory, but before AWS reInvent, AWS had 185 different services. That's an insane product catalog for a company that, with the size of revenue of AWS. If I'm consuming and I'm building products on this, I can't even get Flash out of my environment. Like legit Flash is gone. And there's still applications that businesses depend on because I can't move Flash out. If I'm not looking at it in this product perspective, a lot of what's driving it is, uh, is awareness and training of my customers internally. If I can't get them to the mode that they can consume my 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 services in a cloud like manner, that you know Office 365, whether I want it or not, I'm going to get a new version of it every week. If I can't train my organization to do that from a product perspective of how they consume IT, I'm going to get stuck with Flash in my environment until 2030. Yeah, and what your what your issue is here is one of persistence. This is actually where Rob started the conversation, I, or both Rob and, and Tim. I've got a, you know, I've got a power PC that I'm still based, you know, working on. It's, it persists because it's been there, it's been in-house. I've had 
pretty much complete control of it. And I may have neglected to upgrade it over time. The, the end product of a sassification or modularization by which you create or compose applications is that your ability to count on persistence, if in fact you want it to persist in a particular form is really under, it's under assault. You don't always have the choice of Amazon, of AWS continuing to support a release of something they did two years ago. You're, 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 you're in the stream and you're gonna get washed down the stream with it. So there's a, there's a persistence aspect to relying on somebody else to do this. Your, your other point here though is that the addition of a new approach to management, to operations administration and management is almost by definition when a new, uh, when, a, when the next Kubernetes comes along, you'll have the same kind of sense of, I've got this cloud of small insects, tools that I have to use and I have to pull together in order to manage this new infrastructure. It's aggravating. And I don't know that any of us here have, have really addressed what the, what the driving force needs to be in 2030 in order to prevent this from being a continuous roller coaster on this. I'll take that. Um, it's a sense yeah. of responsibility to the to your customers, whether they be internal customers or external customers, um, or both in some cases. So uh, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was at Yahoo, uh, we built object stores before really anybody else even really had the concept, and we had really good technology. Unfortunately, we had incredibly poor middle management, so nobody understood from a sense of a product how we needed to manage the life cycle of these object stores, cool technology as we deployed them and that we were getting used both by internal customers and also by our web properties. And so we ended up worldwide with many tens of versions of object store that we all had to manage individually um, and operations teams had to manage and they all had very distinct ways that they had to be managed. And we, we should have had one version, the most really, uh, you know, the, the supported version of the object store, but we were terrible at product management and we didn't really care that much about our customers fundamentally. We we're just like, well, you know, it does this, suck it. And that was essentially our attitude internally. And we were very developer cutting edge focused and very not um, concerned about the pain that our customers had to go through. They just had to accept it. And, um, and you know, it, it fundamentally hamstrung the entire company. And Sean, what, what people are seeing, uh, talking to API management companies, co in companies in general are trying to reduce how many APIs they they have, and they're man they if they don't want to manage APIs that that they can't maintain. They want to have good APIs that can be maintained. So basically, keep on people kept on creating more and more APIs in the last five years or so. And they aren't, a lot of them aren't maintained or well documented. So basically, there's lots of products that aren't actually being managed. So, some of this is basically let's make sure we, if you're going to create a product or a service, you actually have enough people that can maintain it. So, Mark, you, a couple of weeks ago, you were talking about if you created a service, can you ever get rid of it? It's that type of thing. It's in terms of product management, same thing. So uh, you have to be careful. You, you, how, you, how many technologies are you going to are you going to use? Are you going to yeah, create? So there there is a real concern about API sprawl, but you know that is bundled in with the SaaS applications that you bring on board. But, but you know you you're consuming an API versus your building quote unquote managing an API. So, you know, let's just tease those two apart. 
So when you say, you know, enterprises don't, they don't want to maintain, manage an API. Well, let's, let's talk about what that really means, right? Is it talking about API workflow, uh, token ID, secrets management, observability through the API stack, stitching it together if you're using multiple applications? That is one aspect, sure. But, you know, if you're a buyer of a SaaS app, um, you're consuming APIs. Uh, you just have to know how those APIs stitch in with a workflow. That's, of course, you know, that, that, is, that is a challenging problem. Um, Sean, to talk about what you were talking about, the object store, um, you, it's, it's a needle you got to thread. So Yahoo's object store was, um, you know, perhaps not very product centric. We were building an object store. Um, and this is at EMC, we were building the Atmos object, object store. We were extremely product centric. We were extremely getting all our use cases, what the features were, the roadmaps as a disciplined organization. We were building our object store there. Um, we got disrupted by AWS. So it's you, you have to thread me and this is the same chat that's happening right now with Kubernetes, right? If you're talking about compute orchestration whether that was through vCenters, VMs, now you go into containers with Kubernetes, um, there is a needle to thread. You know, how opinionated do you want to be? Rob was talking about earlier that he thinks Kubernetes is highly opinionated. Well, it's a spectrum. It's not as opinionated as VMware, so as Cloud Foundry, right? So that was highly opinionated. With Tanzu, they're trying to do exactly the same thing. Rather than just orchestrating VMs, now it's containers. Um, it's where do you are, where, where you are, what your consumers are actually buying. And again, you know, VMware is pretty damn smart. It is, um, you cannot be, you cannot build a product that's everything to everyone. They are looking at what is drawing in the most revenue. That's why they're bundled in with Tanzu, Kubernetes and vCenter. Uh, they don't want to lose the innovation cycle, next gen companies that are consuming containers. Uh, and clearly, they don't want to give up on VM orchestration either. But but they, this might actually be an example for the one of the points I was I was trying to reason through for twenty thirty perspective. They're late, maybe even late on purpose. If Kubernetes is a is a key technology for the next ten years, which I think everybody's has, is going to agree that it is, whether it's for whatever reasons, then then is it okay that it's moving slower, right? That we're gonna count on open, no, to Kubernetes being a stable platform that we can build around. And, Rob, and have what do you, that what do you mean by 10 year old cluster? Sorry. Rob, what do you mean by it's moving slower? What part of Kubernetes is moving slower? If what my, my point with this is that if we keep pushing the, the, the the pace of edge, if, if our expectation is the pace of innovation on the technology side is going to keep increasing, then the, the foundations that we build other technologies on top of are going to be so unstable that we're going to, we're going to either have to completely transform how we think about building technologies so that they're constantly able to shift or things need to slow down so that I can say, you know what, I'm, I'm expecting my Kubernetes application to have a five year longevity in this lifetime in this cluster because frankly once i write the application i don't want to deal with the fact that that kubernetes changed an api and now i need to migrate it so well, the, yeah, one I of mean, the we, challenges we, with this i've talked about it as a slant to vmware which is that vmware moves at the speed of cio which is not particularly fast we, we don't want this technology to move fast, but I do want the advantages of, of, of that the technologies bring. Yeah. And I've struggled with this a lot. If you look at networking technologies and, and operability of networking technologies, ideally that's what I want in my cloud technologies, but it took a really long time to get to those standards and they're very rigid, which you know can limit that on the, on the end. So there is a balance that I think the question is, and this gets into kind of orchestration and management of the community and governance of the community and projects versus products. Projects move a lot faster than products do. But then there's the instability as the enterprise. I can't get flash out of my, 
I'm going to keep picking on Flash. I can't get Flash out of my environment. So if I built these very static point in time applications that I haven't matured my organization to be able to adopt technologies faster. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. If yeah, as a it's consumer, if I can't, if I can't, if I can't map up my organization to adopt and change applications on, on at the speed in which they're developed, do I really want that innovation from the vendor side to move that fast? Yeah, Keith, sorry, I'm getting my brain cells warmed up here for this one. Um, the, the thing I think about is, you know, the way we work in enterprise IT is somewhat lethargic, be, partly because of complexity, partly because of a number of other issues which have to be addressed, just not in this forum, um, but they do impact this. We have to become more nimble as an organization in terms of the, the products and services that we deliver. If we don't, we run the risk of, like you said, the flash example, I'll use a more modern example. Look at Google and AWS. So Amazon has chosen to take the, the business path of we support everything and we continue to support everything, including SimpleDB, which is one of their products from, from the get-go. Um, then you look at someone like Google who might deprecate a service and give you 30 to 60 days to get off of it. I, as an enterprise, I can't, I can't make those kinds of changes overnight and have the, the structure in which to do so, right? We see it with Flash, you run the same risk with Google. I mean, this is probably one of the top reasons why when I talk to other enterprise organizations, other IT leaders, why they don't use Google. One of the top one or two issues is because of this deprecation issue, because they can't move that quickly. How do we start to help people along the way to make them more nimble or help them be, help themselves become more nimble? I don't think it's because the CIO moves slowly. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't buy that. Um, I think it actually is a combination of issues that are around culture, around the role of IT and around technology that we can help influence to help change that dimension. But it has to be done in a very methodical way. Otherwise people will just kind of thumb their nose at it and say, okay, yeah, whatever, move on. You know, so we used, to pick on, we used to pick on Microsoft for being slow at adopting technologies and moving fast, et cetera. What they've done with Office 365 is pretty impressive. So what lessons, if any, can we take from what they've done for product and bringing that to our own environments? Users are not complaining that they're getting a new version. Well, other, unless you're on, on a Mac, right? downloading the new version of Office every week. But for the most part, it doesn't disrupt. It no, it no longer disrupts my workflow to get a new version of Office every week. They've done a pretty good job of making it backwards compatible. It just works. Yeah, but Keith, it's, it's great when you get there. It's the getting there that is problematic. I mean, case in point, 365, and I know you know this. Um, I recently was trying to move from Google Apps to 365 over the break, had a horrific experience, mail corruption, it was a handful of mailboxes, had to back out of the whole thing. If I were trying to do this for an enterprise, holy cow, what a nightmare, what an absolute nightmare. Now, for those mailboxes that are there, great, things are happy, everybody's happy. For those things that are in Google Apps, everybody's happy. But that transitionary process is enough to give me a moment of pause to say, you know what? It's so not to, worth it. I've, I've been involved in Office 365 migrations, and that's pretty consistent experience because you're just, and that and that is the pain. And this is why we don't do it. Is why we don't move from SAP uh, R3 to uh, to uh, SAP HANA because it that's is right. painful. It's expensive and, and it's risky. And so value. again, these are not technology reasons. So, well, I mean, that's an interoperability problem that's been fundamental in the industry from day one. You know, how interoperable do we want as a business practice and or from a just, well, from a business practice. Yep. I mean, it, Microsoft early on intentionally made their their applications very inoperable to thwart competition. Um, I don't think that that's exactly their, their intention today, but that's fundamentally interoperability has been a problem 
from day one. But yeah. Sean, I would say that that 365 is probably a bad example of this, but if we take Keith's other example of SAP or just upgrading an SAP, and those of us that have been through that process, the challenge is ultimately it's not technologically driven. The problem is not because of technology. And the same thing actually holds true with Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Alibaba, in terms of upgrades. If you want to switch, if you want to switch to another provider or make a change to another provider or another version of an ERP system, the problem is because you allowed the business processes to get so complicated that you essentially created your own snowflake of a footprint. And we're seeing the same thing in public cloud infrastructure too, where people are building these, these applications that are so complicated and leveraging all of the different rich features and ecosystems of these major cloud providers, which is great. But if you ever wanted to change, God help you, because it's going to be incredibly problematic. That's not a technology problem. Yeah. So maybe well, not a with that, that, was, a that was my comment on the future sense <laughs> is um, where uh, where does the responsibility lie for that uh, interoperability? Is, does it rely within the customer? Does it rely on the business? Does it re re rely on the standards? Is it government? Um, I, I think probably it's a little bit of everything. I, I, right now, today, I think now. the government thing is trying to put its toe in the water as far as how it's going to enforce interoperability. I think um, that, and I think that's a mistake. I think it should sit squarely at the feet of the customer. The customer uh, needs I, to take responsibility for how they use technology. I think the skills essentially for many of the customers out there because technology has become so democratized, it's just not there. So what guardrails as a society do we put up to protect the average consumer of technology so that they don't end up buying the hype of K8 and that I too can run containers at home. You know, mm -hmm. obviously that's not reality, but you know, if you listen to the hype and you don't know any better, you're gonna think, you're gonna believe it. Well, let's go. Be very unhappy. Go back, go back to what, I'm gonna reiterate what Tim, what Tim just said then. What size customer are you talking about? Because if it's an enterprise, that's on them, right? You, you've hired for that technology. An SMB, different story right? Where it's not their core business. But if you're running, if you're running a full on IT shop, that's on you. Well, I, I, I think some people lobbying their legislatures would disagree. Um, or, it, and, and fundamentally, it is kind of the, the problem. And I know I'm going a little bit of far afield, but this is a topic that's, that's going on right now is yeah, you you're, know, you're actually how much not far field. Sean, how you're much, not far field, so keep going. Okay, so how much responsibility does a company that makes products have to its customers? Where does it begin and end? Um, so it, for example, when, AD, when AWS goes down occasionally, which like any system it does, or when Google goes down, are they responsible? And now, obviously there's SLAs that they have contractual obligations to their customers, but fundamentally on a, on a, on a, on a gen, in a generic sense, do they have a responsibility to their customers to have their services um, available with certain capabilities at certain times? I'd say no from an engineering perspective, but there's a lot of people that don't fundamentally understand how this stuff works. And they're going now to their congressman and, and, uh, and senator saying, this shit's broken, go break up Facebook because they did something bad to me. Um, now I think that's completely naive, but it is the place that we're at. People fundamentally rely on some of these services to help them automate and uh, make their businesses run. Um, and you know, when Facebook tweaks their API so that data flows out of it a little bit uh, slowly for certain types of data fields, it, Im it impacts businesses that are based on that. So he, so you guys hear this, you guys are confirming my comment on cloud making people stupid, right? <laughs> yeah, but the, you know, we okay. could talk about, <laughs> you know, net, net neutrality. Is it, is it the government's role to say that all bits should be treated equal? Like 
from a consumer perspective, I love that I can buy my, get my Verizon phone and get all of this free content, but it stifles competition because now the next HBO Max doesn't have that agreement. So you get into some really complicated, you know, do I really want to be stuck with USB-C for the next 30 years? Uh, the USB connector for the next 30 years as opposed to some other connector because the European Union has, Union has said that everything should be USB mini, which is, I think, the, the, the rule. I have to either ship a dongle or whatever. So how much of the government getting involved with stifle innovation, which typically seems to be the case, versus customers demanding? I, I'm, I'm gonna They're going to going back to lightning in the next for round. just a second, because <laughs> y'all are going back to lightning. <laughs> The, uh, it, and a key and a kite. Nice. Uh, so, so wait, we, we are actually transitioning to what the next top topic is sort of naturally, which I, I love, which is, all right, how are we getting access to all this stuff, right? How do we make sure that the people who are getting it have access and they understand what the consequences are? I mean, we, we just teased out this sort of question of people are all of a sudden dependent on these core technologies and don't even realize it. Who are the have and have nots in these cases? If, if, you know, if my, if, you know, do we have people who are locked out of technologies? I hope you enjoyed this session. Um, it really got me thinking. And part of thinking about pace of innovation is who gets left behind in this rapid frantic pace we have. And that is what we started talking about in the next session, um, social access. So please enjoy that session um, and think about how do we make sure that as we build technology for people, everybody gets access. So we don't just in a rush to get to the finish line, which there isn't, that we leave people behind. Uh, it's important.